welcome back to Digital Artcast. Your, uh, I'm hoping, number one source for all things digital and art related. Uh, my name is Gordon Neal, and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, art and all things awesome to do with art. And I have with me uh, on the other side of the world um, an artist that we've tried to get on a few times, but just through scheduling conflicts and just general life. Um, we've kind of been busy on both ends and trying to get together has been a nightmare as always. But finally, he beat us some time and he has uh, came on today to talk about his career and all things art related also um for you guys checking in we're still nearly towards 2000 subs if always you can share like and comment on this episode or share it wherever you can um to get some recognition for the podcast that would be great and i'd really appreciate it and uh, without further ado um we'll introduce today's guest and that is Gerald sung what's hey, happening Gerald? yo hey Yo, thank you very much for coming on, giving up your time. Um, I know it's greatly important because you're doing so many awesome things over there in uh, Malaysia. But um, oh, yeah, thanks, thanks for coming on. Talk to us. Yeah, thanks no so worries. Much. Um, so yeah, uh, I've kind of came across your work um, a few times. I think actually um, I did you initially as a friend because uh, some projects you were running at the time and you were putting stuff through your Facebook or an art station. Right. Um, and uh, I think the, the kind of interesting thing about you was when I initially noticed a lot of your work at the start, it was more the 2D side of it that I saw. A lot of the sketches you were putting up, um, more your kind of, you know, mech designs, things like that. Um, I think you were doing kind of the, the metalheads uh, <laughs> sketches at the time, which were really, really cool, kind of Gundam-inspired knights with like medieval armor, which I thought was like a, a cool mix of, uh, of two kind of old and new styles. Um and just other things I saw in your portfolio at the time. I think even at one point I saw your uh, your Bastion design, um, the kind of police siren oh, wow. one that you done. So, yeah, I, I love that guy, man. Or yeah, Wars, well, Wars makes well. such good characters. Oh man, this is just oh, that was awesome. That was just we were just talking about that when I was in um, LA in September. Um, I managed to get a wee tour of the the Blizzard campus and see where the the team sat for Overwatch and. Oh um, wow! Yeah. yeah. Little did I know at the time they were just about to announce Overwatch 2. So um, that was a really interesting time to be running about the studio and, and seeing things. Um, of course, the, 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 the unfortunate thing because of just security leaks in general nowadays, um, when we were doing the tour, um, same with when we went to Riot, you could only go in certain areas because uh, like the main areas basically where they were working on stuff, you know, with computers, um, all that kind of stuff was off limits. It was mostly just like the cafeterias and the halls with some of the statues and stuff in it um yeah, yeah been, i was i was yeah. there at riot studios last couple of weeks back i think or maybe months but yeah oh, nice. I, I got you we, yeah we couldn't go into the actual studio space and and see as, what they're actually working on yeah, especially since they're kind of have so many new ips that they're popping out so it makes sense yeah including stuff that's probably not announced or they're just mm. experimenting with or so yeah but no overwatch is my jam man I, I love the fact i think it's one of the the few games i still have on my computer at the moment because it's one of the things like dota where you can go in and like play for 15 minutes and they just come back out and you don't have to spend like you know hours and hours although i saw uh, David Long was posting the other day about, or in fact yesterday, about um, Warcraft 3 Remastered just came out. Um, so I'm like, oh, something else I need to buy and play. And oh, Reforged just time. came out, huh? Yeah, I think it's either today or tomorrow, I think it officially releases, but I think he was getting a kind of pre-early access load before it actually it was, launched. Yeah. But yeah, I've been keeping my eye on that as well for a while because, uh, God, Warcraft 3, I think actually... I wrote my own review of that game when I was like oh. I think eleven <laughs> or ten or something. Nice. Like I wrote an actual like word document, like, oh, this is why I love Warcraft three. And then of course played it for years and then it kinda died out. And then uh famously um somebody modded it and turned it into Dota and then Valve took it yep. all in house. Yep, yep. And yep. Dota two is now a thing. So um yeah, so that's really interesting to see how that all kind of pans out. Um, especially now the fact you play Dota and you're like, yeah, there's all these Blizzard characters that basically are now Valve's IP, but it, which is crazy. So, um, well, well, funny overlap because uh, a big part of Warcraft Three Reforged was done in Malaysia, actually. Oh wow, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah there, cool. it's, it's by the X Studio. I mean, the last studio I worked at, uh, Lemon Sky, and I think early on they they did kind of asked me whether I wanted to jump into art director looked after the project for Warcraft oh, cool. Reforge. 
Yeah, because uh, you worked on um, StarCraft Remastered, right? Yeah, yeah. So they're they are the ones that were uh, Blizzard reached out to them to kind of basically look after their legacy as uh, legacy games. I think is what they called them. Oh, cool. Yeah, legacy as in the OP or OG. Yeah, the original, OG original games. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's, so it started with StarCraft, and that was nice. Yeah. No, there's that. Well, of course, there's such a huge following for all those games, and Warcraft. I think initially was a bit of a weird one because people were like did they really want to bring this back but then obviously everybody was like yeah we really do want to bring it back because it's such an amazing game so yeah um, yeah but then you've worked on like a crazy amount of kind of weird and varied games and <laughs> yeah like everything from sonic to like gears and dark souls you know starcraft like you've just had this kind of list of projects that you've either art directed or concepted for um but then now you're obviously doing stuff with your own studio and you're doing more kind of collectible stuff and, you know, sculpts and like, you're just kind of, that's what I'm saying. You know, when we kind of started the conversation, uh, how I talked about like a lot of the stuff I saw initially from you was your, uh, more sketchy concept stuff, illustration, whatever you would call it. Um, but then you've kind of like, I wouldn't want to call you a generalist because I don't know if that maybe makes it feel like you, don't do everything well or you do everything kind of well but not one thing good specifically but then you do have like the ability to turn your hand to like anything almost like you could do you know 3d or props or environments but you can also do characters and sketching and um so how did that start with you like way back when you started your art career did you train initially for 3d or did you do was your background more in 2d and drawing or yeah, I, I actually got a diploma in, in 3D animation. It's a pretty generic um, paper, but we were essentially trained to be 3D generalists almost for the animation industry here in Malaysia. And that was kind of like the MO of all of the schools at the time, especially the government as well. Um, I think like everyone was trying to bank in on that whole craze with Pixar, DreamWorks, and all animated films. So it was yeah. a big thing in Malaysia. Um, so when I started working in the game industry, uh, I was literally like just modeling super simple props and whatnot. But I think within the first month, uh, probably because how slow and terrible I was, I think I think my boss <laughs> pulled me in and asked me like, "Hey, do you do you like 3D more or do you kind of like 2D?" And I think I he kind of said, "I think I see more potential in 2D." Okay. Yeah, so I was just kind of like, yes, as long as you're not firing me, I'm mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> do, I'm gonna do whatever. I didn't Please say that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, I like, but I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do 2D, and I had zero yeah. idea to be honest. Um, literally, it was just doing stuff and seeing which which thing worked, and if I got good replies from the client and my seniors and whatnot, then I was like, okay, this is good. Then, and if they said right. that, then, then yeah, I'll try to do well, something else. Well, because we, we spoke about that before we kind of started recording, but I was talking about how one of my personal journeys and one of the things that I feel has um, not really held me back, but definitely has, has kept me from um, ascending quickly is the fact that um, I've kind of jumped back and forth between 2D and 3D a lot and been unable of, almost to decide what I want to focus on. But then you've had the opportunity to probably do multiple things because you've probably worked on just such different and varied projects. Um, but have you got one skill set you think defines you? Do you feel like there is one like you stick more to than the other? Oh, yeah. I mean, definitely it's it's concept art. I mean, uh, e like I said, even with the 3D things, I was officially trained to do 3D, but I think I don't have the patience or the the skill set for it. Um, mm. yeah, I think one thing I remember in school was just, I was, I was hyper passionate, but hyper impatient as well. Like I, I couldn't stand looking at the same thing for more like than 10, 10 hours, you know? Right. Yeah. So then the idea of doing retopology and, and doing the UVs and, and this was before topo gun or whatever smart systems that you had, <laughs> right. We, we yeah. were still cutting and, and sewing UVs together. Right. Um, yeah. So I think uh, I've always had the sketchbook in hand and and just never really knew what was the right way to go forward. But I knew I'd like to create pictures. Yeah, because that was interesting. You know, you talked about how you feel you've not got any patience where I think with 2D, 
you need even more patience than 3D because with 2D it takes probably longer to solidify those skills as in you know anatomy figure proportion perspective mm. color light um whereas i feel like with 3d i can usually bash something together quite quickly and it looks reasonable um without you know spending like a ton of time whereas you know an image you know i think there was one you done the 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 white queen and the knights of the round one you know to me something like that would take you know a couple of days maybe even a week or something to try and get that finesse to the absolute nth degree but um yeah in 3d you know you can probably throw a lot of that stuff together quite quickly and, and overpaint so but then you're probably combining a lot of those those skills because you have that 3d background i take it are you using a lot of 2d or sorry 3d bases in your 2d paintings yeah i i kind of take all of the bare necessities from each of them um i i think you're right though because 2d does actually it's kind of like a long game in terms of building up that skill set. Yeah. Uh, I guess the good thing is like I have been sketching since I could remember. Uh, so right. in terms of drawing something out, it hasn't been an issue. Um, right. But painting and getting colors in, that was always kind of my my weak point. So right. um, I think 3D helped me a lot on that. The more I picked up... Um, key shot especially early on just trying out the demo uh it it did allow me to kind of quickly put lighting in but yeah. speaking of which i i did do um i think there was a point i would i would give myself like a monthly challenge where i would give myself a painting that i couldn't cheat like i would have to just kind of paint every part right um and that kind of just helped me hunker down and kind of fill up any gaps that you know, that I didn't have, you know, right. by, yeah, by cheating this whole time. Yeah, because if you use the the 3D route or using photo bash, and then those can sometimes fill in those gaps where perspective could be off or you're not quite sure of where anatomy, so you'll use 3D to figure it out. Yeah. Um, but then the more you do that, you try to eventually make it less and less, so you are just initially, you know, or eventually, sorry, drawing the whole thing from scratch. Um, you can kind of see like even in your earlier stuff, you know, you can see the no gaps you had, but the things you maybe had a bit more discomfort drawn or things you were not 100% sure with. But then yeah. you look at like, you know, your statue concepts for like the Wolverine stuff, like that is like amazing. Like, and that looks like 100% hand drawn and rendered. And, you know, oh, the perspective is great and colors and your whole dynamic posing. So, like, yeah, like it's those things just come with time but i think that's where i was kind of um no weirded out but i felt weird how you said like oh i don't feel like i have patience but it feels like you've had patience your whole career building that one skill up over and over again oh shit thank you <laughs> the words, man. <laughs> yeah. that's awesome no yeah. idea what to say besides no, thanks I, yeah, I, 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 I do compliment my guests so yeah that's the reason you're on here <laughs> so gotcha. but then but then, of course, if you needed to go, because like you said, you're doing the whole uh, statue thing now is a kind of uh, side hustle. Is that the right word to use? Or is that is it more like your main focus now? Or uh, So what, what happened? I mean, the thing is, like, um, statue design professionally, I think, started for me about three years back, um, which, which was a very easy thing for me to kind of work in. I, I mean, I, I went from... I think games for the most part of my years, but kind of landed into statue design. Um, a, a friend of mine worked for a New York based company called Project Triforce. And he, they were looking for an extra artist to, to onboard. And I was on my way leaving an art director position at this outsourcing place called Lemon Sky. Right. And, um, I figured, like, why not? Because I was looking at my room, and and I've been buying toys since I had a paycheck. You know what I mean? Like, it's like a good, yeah, a good, yeah, a good sixty, seventy percent of it unhealthily goes to toys. Mm-hmm. And I was like, why didn't I think of this earlier? I, in fact, I I probably buy way more toys than I play games. Right. So jumping into collectibles is actually pretty easy transition. Um, I I understood even the production aspects of it, the manufacturing right. aspects. Um, and I, I do traditional sculpture as well, you know, with, with clay and whatnot. Cool, cool. So that kind of branched off of its own. And, and within a year, I was working with um, a, a Hong Kong-based company, and then we did 
um, a Thor statue, like all official stuff as well. A Thor statue, a Devil Man mm-hmm. statue, cool. Um, Hunter x Hunter, you know, and it oh, kind nice. of yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I barely know uh, old Japanese IPs, but um, oh man, so many good animes. At the <laughs> yeah, like, I know. There's just too many to like watch them all because there's like every season there's a new set of animes that come out in Japan. And it's, and it's fast, like, right? Like the the amount oh, of yeah. creativity that comes from them is, you know, like. The thing in Malaysia is like we're trying so hard to push our own IPs out, mm. and it takes us like what five years, maybe if we're lucky. Oh, dude, the speed <laughs> that the guys work it, which is criminal, because I think we talked about this with Scott in the last podcast, where um, like I found out a lot of those guys who work, you know, seven, seven eight hour mm. weeks doing making these mangas, and then of course making animes. Yeah. Um, they work so so hard, but they get paid absolute pennies to work on these these massive ma- uh, mangas and animes. They get like you know some of them get like like an animator on like Naruto at one point was making like a thousand dollars a month, um for you know for seventy eight hour weeks, and that is like criminal. Where yeah, you've got guys you know in LA that have got some jobs that are paying them next to fifteen grand a month. So I mean, it's like it's it's such a huge disparity between the two um although it was funny though because we were watching i need to send you the link but there's a an anime out just now and it's all about concept art and about building worlds what um, really yeah, yeah yeah there's a whole it's like a, a set of school kids who want to design their own uh manga i think and then turn it into an anime um so it's all about like world building like how they develop the characters and how they sketch out the the backgrounds and everything and then they have conversations about like modern day techniques that are mimicking like they have this whole conversation about which is quite true how a lot of modern animes now are using 3d yeah. characters and backgrounds to make the transition of making episodes really quick um which you can totally notice now a mile off like when i watch uh, demon slayer now like there's so much 3d in that compared to 2d drawn and um like they have these conversations and you're like wow man like too real like these these things are like so accurate but yeah there's a whole anime now about basically doing concept art and um yeah like it's it's crazy the amount of work that goes into those things and the amount of work that people there's like a really good day in the life series um that i watched there's a, a guy who does like different jobs in in japan like he done a salary man and a chef and everything and a ramen shop and they done one guy from capcom who works as a programmer and showed like his kind of day in the life working at capcom um and then the next one was like a guy who works on uh manga and it was all about his day in the life of how he makes like his pages for his manga every week um and just such such hard workers man it's ridiculous yeah. so much work going on that stuff yeah they, so, they were they were ethics kind of really should and i think it's like across the country right so you you have yeah. just this beast of a nation churning these things out yeah well china's getting like that as well now like they're like i, I even when i was in la i was speaking to john polidori who was originally blizzard and worked on overwatch but then moved to riot games when I was speaking to him, he was like, oh, I'm just about to leave LA. I'm going to work in Seoul to be an art director for a studio over there. But like China and, and also South Korea now are like these huge, massive behemoths that put out these crazy CGs and, you know, films and animations that are just, you know, incredible. Especially the one I think we went to watch in the cinema last year about, uh, was it Abominable? Abominable? It's about the kind of Abominable Snowman uh ah. China right. thing, you, you know, uh, it was the, you know the that's based in China, but then it's like it comes to the, some of these rooftop and they have to take it back to Mount Everest. Um, but the whole uh, animation was done in in China. Um, I think in I'm not sure it was in Beijing, but yeah, but uh, yeah. So there, there's a whole industry there now, and of course, when Warcraft the movie released across there, like it done better there than anywhere else on the planet because there was so much just so much eyes on it at the time and now it's like there's such a thirst for that stuff that they're making their own market and of course now recently all the controversy with of course the the gaming side of it where there's now companies a lot of american companies working with chinese-based companies like tencent and stuff that make all these like i think was it tencent actually who made the call of duty mobile game um as far as i can remember someone told me that but yeah so there's this whole slew of like creativity now that's like bursting out of asia it's like taking over the world so word yeah and and i think like um yeah speaking of chinese like the i i think anime 3d animation wise i think they're, they're hit hitting into like a new renaissance i guess yes um in terms of games I, i'm still not sure i um but mm. I, I feel the same way almost um 
almost everywhere, I think. Uh, there's kind of like 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 a Hollywood problem with games today. Um, mm. like, but indie games are great. I, I'm just referring to like the more expensive ones, I think. The AAA stuff, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because then you've worked on your fair share of that as well, because you've done like everything from like, you know, like Sonic All-Star Racing and, you know, Splathouse and, you know, they're going way back, you know, and then Gears of War, there's no one and your Dark Souls stuff. But is that stuff that's all just been through? Because it's all been through Lemon Sky or other outsourcing studios, right? Uh, yeah, definitely. All of the, the bigger titles that you mentioned just now was through my outsourcing days. So we... Right. I think just just by being virtue of in that company, I, I was lucky to be associated with all those projects. Um, yeah. When when I was in the New York based company, just kind of um, being contracted here, mm-hmm. I did work on the Gears Five at the time. Right, um, but they were all really you know quick touch based stuff. I wouldn't say I'm I'm nowhere even close to someone who has like full AAA experience. I've just been lucky yeah. to bounce around a lot, I guess. Yeah, but then, of course, you have your own story and also background and style that I think is very appealing. And I think sometimes it can be a little harder visibility-wise when you're on that side of the world to try and attract the attention of some of the bigger studios in the West because they typically look for people who are on their doorstep or, you know, if they're going to bring someone across, it has to be someone who is, like, you know, like a major player, someone who you know, has, like, this massive following. You know, like, Kim Jong-ji at the moment is getting, like, so much clout in all these different companies and so many projects, but it's because he's so incredible. You know, he's, like, such yeah. a phenomenon in himself. Um, even, uh, do you know an artist called TB Choi, by chance? Yeah. Yeah, so Choi, like, she is, well, I mean, she's just incredible to start with, but then she's done so many projects now just on her own that she's attracting, like, so many studios because of just her whole... Um, persona and style is so incredible like I bumped mm. into her at LA as well at Lightbox and you know her figure drawn stuff is ridiculous I mean no wonder she's a, a, a life drawn teacher back in, in, in South Korea but like you know her whole aesthetic and her style is just incredible um, I think I actually got word of her work initially because she was done a lot of stuff for Ubisoft on Rainbow Six ah. and she done the Rainbow Six Siege comics so um yeah, just an incredible talent. Although, again, still so young and, you know, still so kind of unknown, but, like, people who are in the industry and really follow that kind of stuff know who she is. Um, but, yeah, like, unless you're, like, that caliber, almost, like, a lot of studios won't really look for you or won't really notice you as much. Um, and like I say, especially across that side of the world, if you want to work for Blizzard and, and Riot and stuff like that, you really need to be making, like, a huge noise for people to to really stand up and, and take uh take notice of you but then of course you're building right you I mean even the time you've been in the industry just now people would say that's just like a a start or a foothold in the industry because it takes sometimes so long to break into different places and do different projects like is, is this why you're doing kind of your own studio stuff now or you're focusing on your own stuff because you want to have your own kind of part of the industry that you want to kind of have control over uh it was it was i think um I want to do something in Malaysia for Malaysia as well, I mean, for my country. So um, I think I, yeah, definitely kind of going out to network. It's definitely one of my biggest weaknesses. I, I do like, I do like the privacy of my office, uh, but that's, that's all changing as I mean, I'm running a studio and I think networking is, is it's so key. The well, they're right running, um, just to interrupt you, but they're running uh, Trojan Horses a Unicorn, the one that usually runs, and well, it's now in Motland, it was originally in Portugal and Lisbon, but there's now a THU in, in, uh, it's in Japan, I think, is it oh, Kaga, really? Kaga or something? Yeah, yeah, they're running one in Japan oh, this cool. year Bye. in September, I think it is, and I think it's, is it Kaga, I think it's in, it's somewhere in, kind of, it's like in the, no, the country, but outside of the city, it's in a kind of middle remote Wait, area. So Kaga's the place? I think it is, yeah, hold on, I'll just try and look that up, THU Japan, it's been run and kind of organised, uh, Andre has got his hand in it, but it's mostly been run by the guys who organise and run Polygon Pictures in Tokyo. Um, they're goodness, kind of organising yeah. the event, yeah, yeah Kaga, yeah. city of yeah. Kaga. I see and, it. Yeah, yeah. So there, there, that event's happening um, in May. Yeah, May this year. So that's what a couple of months from now. 
Um, but I think there's still there's still uh, tickets and stuff. But then that's more your side of the world, right? So that may be a bit easier for you to get to. Yes, because um, because I, I know there it's not like a recruitment thing. So won't be people there looking for to hire, but there will be a lot of industry people there, and it will be a good opportunity to mix and meet people and um because yeah definitely i think my superpower over the last couple of years has just been visibility and networking and getting to know people um my weakness has been the work side of it and producing a lot of stuff from my portfolio so now i've kind of switched now so i'm not doing anything this year and i'm just focusing on my portfolio but then yeah this would probably be a good event for yourself or anybody in, in asia really because um you know Andre runs an amazing event and mm-hmm, now, mm-hmm. now that it's in Japan it opens the door to like a whole slew of people that couldn't get over to Europe to, to experience it so um, so yeah that might be something for you to look into and, yeah thank yeah. you I mean uh, I'm, I definitely am yeah, actually I'm, I'm looking at the site now so yeah yeah definitely I think it's uh, yeah May May time in Kaga and uh, yeah it's supposed to be I think they're kind of focusing on storytelling and finding out how to uh push the industry forward in that essence so yeah it could be a good opportunity to to meet people even just to bump into a couple of guys from polygon pictures because i know Word. like they're, yeah. they're always looking for people um for their projects i mean i know when i came back from thu last year they had the uh, shuvo uh, or shuzo i can't remember if it's shuzo or shuvo but he put out a, a kind of thing in his facebook he was like we have so much work because they're working on this stuff for netflix like we need a lot of people so mm-hmm. um but i think that's always the case because they get they're like access to get so much work all the time and they've been going since like the 80s or something so yeah they've been around yeah. man a long time yeah i actually yeah. sat down with their, their ceo at thu and we were kind of just eating something at one point i, we I heard that yeah 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 and he was i was like oh yeah like uh yeah like blah 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 talking away and half an oh what do you do are you an artist he's like oh yeah I run polygon pictures i was like oh. <laughs> yeah jesus christ okay all right cool yeah no worries uh changes the yeah, dynamic a little yeah bit. definitely <laughs> but the, but that, that's what is the good thing about this industry is the fact that you can talk to people at that level and Word, still yeah they're just as as human as the next so um but yeah man check out the the thu event in japan i think it would uh it would be a good opportunity for you to get across and showcase some of your work and and rub shoulders with a a couple of people in the industry because there's always there's always a lot of good people go to those things um i think actually a lot of people i knew who went to thu last year instead of going to the malta one this year they're kind of switching their funds and making sure they can go to the japanese one um instead because uh well obviously people want to go to japan and check that out because of the olympics and stuff but also um mm. just a totally different setting so um yeah definitely maybe an opportunity for you to, to rub shoulders with a couple of different people and, and some yeah some polygon guys so, i am yeah. making a, a trip to san francisco this march for uh, games connection america so oh cool nice that's gonna yeah, be I know, um i think gdc's is soon, it's, right it's, it's it overlaps actually so gdc is kind of like the game developer thing and gc yeah, is here. yeah is gonna be i think all all business actually so oh right okay yeah, right a, yeah interesting it's gonna be like like a speed dating thing where they're gonna check your <laughs> yeah yeah I, i've been to you know business is weird man like it, it has yes it's a strange thing like especially the whole outsourcing world yeah there's, a, there's definitely more I've seen because it used to be like even I had a worry when I was initially thinking about doing 3D where I thought that I would have to I mean eventually I think if I want to work in AAA I'm going to have to go and move to a studio somewhere mm-hmm. but I know that there's more like Airborne Studios and like you said Lemon like there's a couple people now who offer artists the opportunity to work on this 3D stuff but again remotely so you don't have to be in the studio like a lot of the Airborne guys can say like oh, I've worked on Overwatch but you don't have right. to go and work in the studio in, in California. Like you can just work remotely from wherever you live. Um, and also Decagon, like they've had a whole thing of mm. like outsourcing as well. So yeah, there's like there's a whole opportunity now, even in 3D. Um, I even know some guys like way back in the day who were making like Dota skins, you know, and making a fortune off that because if their skin gets paid, they get so much from Valve. But um, you can make a pretty decent living just doing that all the time. So yeah, you'll probably find with your your model uh, kind of business that you can turn that into like a semi outsourcing studio for different companies if you go there because you've already worked in those studios and you've got a a feel for what it takes to you know fulfill those studios needs. So you probably yeah. could yeah. start to air it towards and say, look, it's not just me. I can maybe get people involved and we can start pushing this to more like an outsourcing studio than just collectibles or just statues. Um, 
yeah, there's a whole range of stuff you can do now. The, the internet is powerful, right? Like, there's so much stuff you can do remotely now. So, um, yeah, I've, I have a friend who is doing the full uh, nomadic lifestyle. Even, in fact, I think he he just got here with his wife and son to Malaysia. He's from Sweden. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah well, Malaysia is like, especially places like uh, Bali and that. Like, there's whole kind of renaissance or a whole kind of revitalization of those places because they're really really beautiful you know there's so much natural wonder yeah but then they're also yeah. very cheap to live in and don't cost a lot of money you know your your wage you would get from an american studio will go like a lot further in a country where you know you can buy you know a, a three-course meal for like less than 10 pounds uk i mean so it just shows when people go travel there like how affordable it is and that's what makes it more interesting for people who want to go to live in those places so um yeah. yeah yeah i mean it's it's strange that you kind of have to do that to get a, like a quality of life thing but yeah that's kind of like one of the reasons why everyone's doing the whole um earn first world country and live yeah. third world country kind of a thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i mean like malaysia i wouldn't say I would, I yeah know, we're, i think we're not, officially a developing country maybe I think yeah i was gonna right. say it's not quite what it used to be maybe even like 20 30 years ago when maybe you were younger you know and and you lived there but um but yeah definitely like even people would say i suppose that about scotland that you know but then of course because we're lumped in with the united kingdom that's always been quite a developed country and has always prospered and and terms of technology and, and economy although brexit <laughs> i feel like it's just got it oh man yeah, you guys are... this place. Oh, God. This so is the, was it the first this is the first week official that brexit happened was it um next yeah, week no they're they're just i think even today i think they're um signing like the the whole yeah. official like leaving documents and gotcha. what's going to happen oh, it's just so i mean like it's Every intellectual or business-minded person I spoke to has been like, Brexit is going to be the worst thing that ever happens to the UK. But then this country is... I want, I don't want to say the UK is racist because there are good people here, but like, there's so much hate to foreigners that really sucks and really drives people's opinions mm. before they even think about how, you know, how much of a skill gap or how much of a deficit we're going to be in when we cut yeah. off our supply to European countries um, because the European Union has funded so much mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. many projects across here, like, you know, parks projects or charities or schools, loads of things like that. You know, there's a lot of places you can't walk about in Scotland and you see like a little plaque in your local park that says funded in, you know, in whole or in part by the European Union. So yeah, a lot of good has come from us being part of that. But then, of course, people will see the, the negative side of, people who are foreigners coming to take jobs from people but it's like they don't understand the dynamic they don't understand what really is happening and what jobs they do take and and don't take and how you know what, what percentage of foreigners actually contribute towards and what don't so because even when you look at like the social uh, security system a lot of people who are in benefits in this country the highest population or the highest percentage of those people in benefits are actually white and british so you know it's actually them that are sucking the economy dry not people who come in from foreign countries so yeah a lot of people when they voted on brexit it was purely because they had the distaste for foreigners um as do a lot of countries really a lot of europe's kind of like that in parts you know they don't like people from the outside so um but then in malaysia is that the, is that kind of getting like that now because so many people are traveling there and trying to live you know, for not a lot of money, do you feel like it's maybe an overrun now in parts because of uh, tourists or, or people try to live there? I, I wouldn't say that. I, I do think, I do think every country kind of has like an identity issue. <laughs> it's like, where yeah. there's like, uh, I'm pretty agnostic about the way countries are like, yeah. Um, no, yeah. I think it's just because eventually I think what's going to happen is it won't be, like you know people will be from one city or one state or one country like exactly the planet will just yeah. be the, it'll just be the planet people will just move freely between all countries um because then even you, you know people were starting to get surprised about how many uh cases of this virus were going about from from chinese citizens from wuhan but then i think for that site's population something like 11 million people like it's more than double the amount of people that live in scotland so yeah, there's obviously going to be people going back and forward for the Chinese New Year, the, you know, the lunar uh, celebrations. So, of course, there was going to be people in all parts of the world that were traveling to 
Canada and America and Japan and Malaysia and Australia. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, if, if you're not thinking that we're a global, I think it's a global entity now, like it's, yeah, you'd be surprised. You're going to be pretty surprised. It's, oh, yeah, it's all definitely. connected at the moment. So like the idea that uh, I think UK wants to separate themselves it's yeah, a little yeah. too late <laughs> i know which is interesting as well because we had this whole conversation about like that's something that we we're like oh no we don't want to separate from the eu but then of course in scotland we've been really desperate the last couple of years to separate from london and become yep. independent yep. also same with uh catalan and spain when they tried to separate from madrid and then of course that ended a horrible way but um but yeah like it's this whole thing of like trying to go back to people having borders and walls and things put up so that people can't get in and out and it's just i mean like i think the the london thing was more justified for us being independent because we are like a small nation upon ourselves. and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. when you look at the two biggest cash generators in the uk it mostly is just the whole of scotland and london that are the two biggest incomes um so that's something i think we want to really take our, our kind of future and our country and our control in our hands but then, yeah, it's hard to then argue because people are like, oh, no, but you want to be, you know, separate, but you want to also be part of Europe. It's like, oh, yeah, it's difficult. It makes it's sense. Difficult. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so side note, I, I was in Edinburgh, very nice place. I mean, I had a oh, great yeah. time there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was a, I remember I was having a conversation with someone the other day and they were like, oh, yeah, Edinburgh, is there much game development there? And I was like, yeah, there's Rockstar North. They make Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But, like the biggest game franchise on the planet next to like Call of Duty. Yeah, it's made here in Edinburgh. And they were like, oh, shit, I never My realized. Goodness, and then, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. It, that's, yeah. I always well, assumed that they were in LA because of the way that yeah, because yeah, there's GTA. there's um there's there used to be DMA designs in Dundee, and then uh they moved in Edinburgh offices and then uh take two interactive bought them and mm-hmm. take two at the time had a lot of rockstar um studios ah. and then they they had like different names for them so there's rockstar london leeds new york la and then in scotland they became rockstar north and uh they basically bought the rights to grand theft Auto, and then they made three four and five um ah. out of the studio in edinburgh gotcha. so yeah although it was it was mostly just like not Rockstar North by themselves would make that whole franchise, but now with Red Dead and now I'm assuming with the new GTA, it's becoming more a collaborative effort. So all the studios around the whole planet mm. contribute in small parts to the, like with Red Dead, like Rockstar North worked in it, but they worked in certain parts of it. And then, you know, New York had some and then San Diego had parts as well. Um and then again when it comes to Grand Theft Auto, they'll probably do the same. They'll start, you know, outsourcing different parts of different studios as well because it'll be such a i think because the games are so large now you can't really just have one team work on it Um you really need multiple entities um contributing in different parts so um but yeah there's there's rockstar north they've been here forever blazing griffin outplay um the there's a new company just actually opened up in edinburgh called build a rocket boy um but apparently it's x rockstar guys and crytek people as well um i think they're working on a triple a developed game um although they've not announced anything yet but they have been hiring recently so yeah there's a lot there is a lot here uh, and there's access of course in in glasgow who do um cg cinematics for blizzard and magic the gathering and gears of war and that kind of stuff so right yeah yeah there's 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 a there's a, a healthy kind of tech industry here um and my partner she works in uh um programming she's a software developer and she does different things around the country as well so oh that's a yeah. great career man <laughs> yeah yeah oh, <laughs> oh my she will, goodness she'll be, she'll be doing quite well compared to me when it, in the next couple of years so yeah. yeah yeah she'll be doing very well so uh so yeah so it, it's an interesting time to to be involved in the country and yeah it's a good opportunity also like you said we talked about this originally about being a nomad and traveling and seeing different parts of the world um and then of course malaysia is now like a destination for people who want to live that nomadic lifestyle but don't want to have a desk or an office they can just get up in the morning and you know sip their coffee in front of like you know an ocean wave or a bar on the beach you've not got to be stuck in an office or you know doing whatever basically you can just make your own your own time and rules so yes yeah, it's, it's a good time to be alive so you're doing the whole uh collectible thing what else is on the cards for you? What else are you kind of, is there anything you can talk about that you're working on just now that isn't like kind of covered in NDA or something that you're working on that isn't stuff you can't announce or? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um... <laughs> what can you talk about? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, do- well, you're doing the, you're doing the whole collectible thing. Is is there something that you're specifically working on just now with that? Is there like one particular model that you're building towards at the moment, or? Uh, you mean what what statues am I have I worked on or am I working on right now? Well, yeah, because I, I I don't know much about the company because we've, we've talked briefly about you have the company set up and you want to do collectibles, but as what have you produced since you've kind of set up? Is there ones that have already come out or are coming out or? Yeah, I, I guess I should clarify. I mean, so my my studio is called Ten Ten or like one zero one zero Ten Ten Studio. And we're, we're kind of like, we, we actually focus on pure 2D concept art outsourcing. So we do illustrations, we do designs, and we've, we've worked on a games, animation, and, and sometimes even statues, I guess, because of my, my background. All right. So uh, it's, it's kind of like a mixed bag. So I, I guess I just took everything that I could do and personified it into a studio <laughs> with my team. Right. Uh, uh, right, okay. So, so that's why it's it's a little bit kind of uh, broad our service route. Yeah, there's a lot of different things that you do kind of really well or outsource. So you've got your concept side of it, and you can do some 3D or some. So are you are you using the studio to concept for models as opposed to building them in 3D yourself? Yeah, definitely. We're 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 kind of like um, more in the the business model to six mod vodka or. Opus ah, Art, right. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm with you now. Right, okay, so it's more the concept inside of it as opposed to the 3D stuff. But then the 3D is like the end result, but then you're more at the, the pre-production phase. You're there concepting the initial designs and sizes. And but then, of course, you also have experience in 3D and like you said, yeah. traditional stuff as well. So when you draw that stuff out, you can understand more how that's put together than anybody else. Yeah, and uh, what we actually offer in, in kind of like all of our dealings is that we, we can even do the 3D block out for you because we, we use it for ourselves as well. Right. And that helps a lot in the production. So if it's a statue, it will lock down basically the momentum, the energy mm. of the piece. If it's mm. a mechanical design, it will just give us all the volume key points that we need for the design. Right. So I, I do think like that's the way the entire industry is shifting anyway is either going to be a VR sculpt or a 3D blockout uh, or some yeah. form of additional media to support your design. Uh, well, so we're just kind of working with that. Yeah, of course. Now I was going to say with 3D printing because you yeah. Know, one of the, yeah, the greatest thing now is that like when I was at LA, Raf had his table and he was selling his Yoshimitsu sculpt. Um, oh, but right. also but also his Nova sculpt and I got one of his Novas and brought it back signed. So I have like one of like maybe 20 Nova busts that Raph sculpted nice. sitting on my, my office table. But like the ability now to produce that stuff at like a cost effective measure, you know, he at the time uh, kind of went through a third party who uh, molded them for him. But then the end, produce, end production prints were like so detailed, like the, you know, the, the little parts of his armor that were kind of studied and stuff that you know like for such a a not generic mold but a mold that was like kind of set that wasn't like super you know in depth there was so much detail in the model there was so many tiny just you know bumps and scratches and chips of his armor you could see that came out really really well um and it all kind of got put together with magnets so you can actually take them apart and then put them back together all sticks together um oh, that's a good f- one i mean they're not all like that though i have to say i mean i've, I've worked with factories that don't give you the full monty oh uh, okay yeah, yeah. so yeah, I, I, no, I did i did yeah. release a statue on my own and and we i i think we 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 tried our best with the budget that we had <laughs> yeah the nicest way i could say it um yeah so so there were like some things that i wish could have been done better yeah no i mean i think it's just in general you've got to think about cost effectiveness and i mean when raf was selling his stuff at la he definitely wasn't selling it to make a profit. Like I think oh, yeah. the money, Makes the money sense. he made was like just covering his costs and no mm-hmm. more. Um, in fact, he probably ended up paying a bit of money for it. But the idea wasn't for him to build a business to sell models. It was just to get people to see and hold his stuff that he created um, and have a kind of like rem- I keep saying kind of memoir. Um, mm, but yeah. then he was saying like, if you want to actually make money, you know, you have to sell like Sideshow, you know they sell a model for seven, eight hundred dollars. I mean, and they've got to because there's so much work goes into them because they're also hand painted. So 
you know, his stuff wasn't even painted. It was just the it was just the grey right. sculpt render. Right. So, but then to take, you know, like the Yoshimitsu, he actually he brought the kind of full size one that he ended up airbrushing and painting himself. Um, but then he was saying if you had to sell that to make a profit, I mean, you're talking like people couldn't have offered him enough money to buy that. Like it was so yeah, cool. yeah, like, one so, off, yeah. right? Yeah, it just yeah, like, it doesn't I mean, make like, sense. If somebody was about to walk him in maybe five or six thousand mm-hmm, dollars, then like mm-hmm. maybe. But like you know. That I mean, unless you're willing to pay that kind of money, then you're never going to get quality stuff. And I think that's where it's been good. Where I'm trying to mind the first for you figures or something like that, but they do a yeah. lot of license stuff. First four figures, yeah, yeah, yeah. They've done. They've been kind of good in in the way that they've kind of built the business model. That they've went to the companies and got the licenses and built merchandise based off that IP. And that's where a lot of the businesses came from. They'll be able to get orders and keep business going because they're using those ips like i think a couple of months ago they done the spiral remastered um yeah. statue crash bandicoot stuff uh okami i think is one of the latest they've just re- yep. announced yep so yeah like bursting on those ips is like the best way to get people to pre-order that stuff because uh unless you get that kind of clarity or that kind of big name behind your stuff then you're really going to struggle to shift statues um in general so um but then is that something you would want to do eventually is go straight from concept and then actually build something yourself and produce stuff for the studio like as part of like you know start selling stuff online or uh i i want it for my own ips i mean the the whole metalhead thing was like my like a little dip into creating my own products yeah, because they're freaking awesome, man. They're like oh, they think it was almost like like a uh, Gundam kits, because like they just seem like that kind of uh, pre-built mecha kind of style. Um, but yeah, like those things would be would be great. Actually, they would look, look really good on on anybody's desk. But uh, but yeah, stuff like that would be awesome to print and send off. Even just maybe even um, I know where I done it way back uh, last year, where they made a whole board game and they shrunk a lot of their things down to miniature size, so they had like the you know the mini <laughs> nice yeah. yeah they would be really cool to make even like a board game out of metal heads or you know make them in like small collectibles like armies and stuff like that if that oh, makes sense yeah i know I, w- yeah. I would love that so i think at the yeah. moment i'm just kind of uh, gradually building building out concepts for them and, and doing little write-ups yeah and then eventually try and get them kind of out into people's hands or get them out into people you know like me even run like a, a kind of kickstarter and back it and try and get it any like a yeah. an actual full board game or oh. a miniatures game you yeah know? but the but first then, product was actually true kickstarter yeah it, it kind of helped us at least kick it off the ground yeah because then you're kind of entering uh like warhammer territory right like you're starting to use the the minifig kind of way like the same the way the, the warhammer guys have the figures for you know the the collectibles yes yes games workshop yeah yeah who are of course legends and you know yeah and i mean that's what's gonna say when you talk about you know the warhammer stuff you think about the money they guys have made over the last however many years um doing warhammer stuff and they could, I think they've got a license to print money at this point because, you know, a lot of their stuff is is really great. But then I think the reason I always shied away from it is because it can start to cost like so much money to get involved in buying all those figures and especially like the larger units that are like, you know, the huge tanks and stuff. You know, they cost <laughs> sometimes like 90 pounds over here, nearly 100 pounds. And yeah, which is like so much money for like one tiny little figure. But um it's, yeah, it's funny because like my my girlfriend actually works for a games workshop at the moment so oh wow yeah she's in um 3d nah, stuff as well or no nah, no nah, she's she's part of like their um business and operations side oh cool right yeah. okay yeah so so i get like a i get to use her staff discount which is the best thing ever like, <laughs> we, were, <laughs> we were we were buying so much stuff and and just oh kind of not not building and painting them they're just kind of sitting at my my yeah the desk stuff. room yeah. yeah yeah no i've had a i've had a couple of them just sitting on my desk at one point because they're just so cool to look at like i it's know just awesome. i know no yeah. your desk, so. but do, I, I, the best... I would kill for like a large scale posable version you know um, oh yeah i think that'll probably come at one point once uh especially once 3d printing gets more because i know people are starting to 3d print them exactly just to have that they have the armies, but then you can't use those in games because they have a whole rule like it has to be the official ones and it has yeah. to come from yeah. their kits. 
um but then it's like there's so many people who would love to probably get the knowledge to how to build their own and build their own variants of those things mm-hmm. so but then of course it's like just to have it in your desk i think the only thing that's uh that's been the best addition to my desk in the last like six months is that Sphero, the company from America, they had the little ball that like rolls around your floor. Yeah, yeah, they, they made the BB-8 as well, right? Well, yeah. So I was going to get that, then I found out they made an R2 unit. So oh, I've got now a nice, good call. R2D2 that like rolls around my carpet at night and like beeps and stuff. So, um, but yeah, like the ah, toys, man. And I think that's a great testament to just the industry is that most people will work in this industry because we're fans, right? Because we love games or toys or, or whatever you know or movies you know people getting in the movie industry you know mm-hmm. you listen to so many people who worked on all the, the latest star wars were like yeah like you know I, I watched star wars as a kid and i was a huge huge fan of it and you know like i, I wanted to work on this because specifically i was a star wars fan so yeah it's like it's a great instance when you get to translate those skills into something that you're super passionate about like you said you know working on the games workshop stuff if you ever got the chance or working on like a, a marvel superheroes statue because you're getting to be part of that world for a second so um so yeah like it's just it's amazing that the opportunities that, and like you said you know with you working in malaysia you can work with all these major companies around the world because you now can have an online presence right you can now have an online presence to talk to people in new york or california or japan or whatever really eh? you know because um you know there's no there's no barrier there's no um border really that stops you working in different places so um yeah and yeah. i i do think there's there's like a nice added sensibility as well i think a lot of times when the clients do reach out to my studio is because they're, they're looking for just a different format of input creative wise yeah so it kind of works its way out being far out here and and I think Malaysia is unique in that sense because uh, we're quite English educated, right? We, we did have a, a British presence in our history. Okay. And, but we, we still kept a lot of our migrant roots and migrant heritages. So yes, we, we're always on the outside looking in. I mean, I grew up yeah. with American shows. I grew up with mm-hmm. Western games, but mm-hmm. then anime came in and most of us grew up with that as well so a lot of our input is like a heavy influence of basically everyone's media yeah so so we're super flexible in that sense western media has influenced so much and just the general culture in the east and you look back to how manga was originally conceived it was when you know after the second world war a lot of the american troops gave the kids uh, american comics at the time right. like Captain america stuff and then those illustrations were then interpreted with their own style which was mixed with their calligraphy and then that became the original manga and then of course eventually anime so yeah there's a whole you know western influence but now i think a lot of the eastern styles have been developed a point now like they have their own you know anime and manga in japan especially or just in in general in in asia it has its own identity because of the years of refining it and making it its own thing and now a lot of western companies are now trying to emulate their style Mm -hmm. because you look at especially riot games like a lot of their stuff is very heavily anime influenced so yeah it does it makes total sense that it's kind of went full circle um and now malaysia of course and china are all picking up on the the mobile gaming and the cinematic stuff so um yeah man i, I give it a five more years and you're probably going to see like some major stuff coming out of asia um because like i say i'm pretty sure tencent are based in china and they i'm sure they did work on the call of duty mobile game which was like the biggest selling mobile game ever so um yeah like the, that kind of stuff is just going to keep keep coming out and then i think obviously PUBG also has a lot of korean roots as well and oh yeah because uh blue hole is basically korean yeah yeah they're also there and then like i said you know blizzard has you know ties with a lot of chinese companies and uh, i know riot games definitely has as well so if i can think i'm pretty sure that riot's one of their their biggest investors is, is chinese backers as well so yes yeah there's a lot yeah there's a lot of people who have now mixed across to those countries and um it's probably going to be you're probably on the right side of the world to be starting your company because there's going to be more and more outsourcing studios and there was a whole thing an article i read actually where people were talking about AAA game development and how they were wondering if it was still a viable thing in this time and age because they felt that 
games were almost coming to a point like movies years and years ago where there was a, a kind of huge collapse um i doubt it would get to that point because there's still so much money in games but they were more saying like triple studios would start breaking off and you would see more outsourcing studios around the world like you are kind of building do you feel that's accurate do you feel like that's something that will be happening eventually i i do think there's going to be a split where right you, you you're not going to get one monster from machine anymore i don't think so Right. Um, it's the same with the way the economy is going as well. That you have like, well, I shouldn't say that, right? I, I, yeah. I, I do think there's just opportunities for everyone. Um, yeah, of course. But we are growing at a at a pace that is, I don't think we even understand. Like the right. the what you can create as an individual and this as five people now, like a small yeah. team, and then how you can sell it is totally different. I, the, yeah. the whole open market thing as well that's the the big kicker you, you don't need like a giant service center anymore yeah you can just do it from smaller kind of more core defined places that are mm-hmm. dotted throughout the the world you know I, I was even watching a documentary recently on um super giant games the guys who made bastion and mm. um transistor and now hades and they're only a team well now they're like a team of maybe 20 people if even that was that the, started- the, the no clip one yeah, but that's yeah. but then they, they started with like five people in some of these bedrooms. So I mean, like the the way that they've kind of built as a company, they were very small, very core. Only I think I'm looking at like two or three artists that work for them. Um, but think of how much success those games have had over the last ten years. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's well, very, even Minecraft, very... right? I mean, that's like the the definition of a success story for games. Oh yeah, like when he sold that to Microsoft for mm-hmm. I think it was uh, I think it was billions, billions yes. of dollars. Yeah. So you know, like yeah, his his life goal has definitely succeeded. But yeah, it was even Notch was saying you know he was just doing it as a fan project, and then it just absolutely blew up into this thing. PUBG is the same, right? I mean, it was yep. like a mod of Arma Three, and now. Like it's its own thing. It has its own tournaments, its own international ties, its own, you know, you know, tournaments and all that kind of stuff. So, like, yeah, the the sky is the limit for people who want it. And like we were talking about early, very early on about Warcraft Three coming back, but then of course that had a whole legacy over the last ten years where that was modded and made into a completely different game. And now Dota, you know, their international tournaments run prize pools of up to thirty million dollars, which is crazy. So oh, yeah. <laughs> like. Nothing, yeah, nothing like, beats league in that aspect, though, because like, I think community yeah. wise, man, they they push, they did so many things right, and they yeah. were so clear with what they wanted to do. They were uh, when I was getting the tour from my pal Lydia, who works there. Um, mm-hmm. She's actually working on the the FPS they just announced. So that was her, what she was working on. Oh, nice. Um, but then she took me into the the kind of little round, the octagon thing that they oh, do. Oh, yeah, I was there. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. And then I was watching some of the, the live streams and I was like, oh, shit, I've been there. I've stood like on that stage. I know exactly where they are. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see like all these little kind of nooks and crannies and, and the parts of the studio and then you're like walking about it. You're like, oh, wow, I've been there and I've seen that. And um, But yeah, League is... League is, I think a lot of their attendance is like, it's, it's rivaling some NFL games now. So yeah, yeah. you're definitely going to find in the next five to 10 years, esports is definitely going to be like something that's going to be mainstream and like streaming on TV and will replace stuff like soccer eventually and football and rugby and tennis and all that kind of stuff. Like there'll start to be more of those tournaments just broadcast everywhere. Like even Evo now, like the, the fighting game tournaments, like those run like in the hundreds of thousands of people. So um which are, are crazy crazy people that you know play these games you know constantly and then come to these tournaments and all over the world and take home millions for just being able to play stuff like tekken or street fighter or king of the fighters um yeah it's a it's just a great time i think technology wise to be alive and be a geek also in this culture because um there's so much opportunity for you to work in games or work in statues or work as a an esports athlete so sky's the limit really yeah even with cloud gaming right i mean we haven't really gone into that yet uh, oh yeah god i actually just uh i'm i'm part of the stadia founders group so i'm using oh. google stadia stuff um which has been great like i've <clears throat> i've really enjoyed it but um at the same time it's lacking a lot of really good features that I feel xCloud is kind of trumping them with the fact yeah, that yeah I've been I've been following the yeah. news yeah Stadia isn't doing too well 
I mean, it's okay, but like, I love the fact that I can open like a tab in my browser and jump into a, a mm-hmm. game of Red Dead or something like that. But at mm-hmm. the same time, there's only maybe 20 games in the whole service where I think xCloud is up to nearly 100 now. And it's getting to the point they're going to announce like a game pass for that as well. So you pay like, yeah. an extra £5 a month or something to top your game pass and you get access to all the xCloud games, which is just going to absolutely destroy Stadia because they just don't have enough games. And they also have to, you have to buy the games individually at full price sometimes. So, yes, counter to what they were trying to, to sell initially. It's pretty so, much, yeah. 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 I mean, like, I don't, I don't really regret buying it, but at the same time, I feel like it just hasn't hit as hard as I thought it was going to. When I initially looked at the whole package, I thought, like, definitely, I would say the one thing that Stadia has going for it is that on the technology side of it, no one is kind of coming close to what they are doing at the moment because right. they have, the highest fidelity graphics mm-hmm. running 60 fps 4k and also streaming and they also have like a super low latency lag but i think the thing that's that they're losing out to in xbox terms is they just don't have enough content if they had like 100 games and they had something where you paid so much money per month to get like 30 40 games you know included that would be definitely something that we'd, we'd be able to rival xbox with but at the moment with their lack of games and the fact you have to pay full price for them it definitely takes away for the experience and uh yeah also the their 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 fidelity of graphics and stuff is really dependent on a really good connection and it can sometimes be spotty over here so um definitely if you haven't got a great connection in your country then you're going to struggle so uh, which is the same from all cloud gaming like how all cloud gaming relies on the internet but um yeah stadia sometimes can be quite picky about how it was but then of course it's the, it's the very start i think when the free version of it launches this year where people will basically be able to play get those games for free on their web browser without yep. having to pay anything. Yep. That's when it'll take off. But then at the moment, because it's behind a paywall, that's what makes it really hard to get behind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, definitely like a time to be a geek is like, you know, it, there's so much stuff going on just now. There's almost too much. That's the problem. I think even we try to settle down and do some work on your computer. It's like you've always got the temptation to be able to just jump on and play a game or, watch something on netflix or you know oh my goodness yeah actually you're, you're right i mean because i i teach students so i think man is it just a more distractions of being an art student today is going to be intense oh ridiculous no you mentioned that um studio ghibli just uh, signed a deal with netflix so i think as of saturday like all the ghibli films are going to be on netflix oh uh, wow yeah, yeah so i was like whoa that's gonna i didn't be know that's <laughs> dude time to binge man like oh yeah definitely man there's a lot of ghiblis that i haven't actually watched yeah i've watched like the core ones like mononoke yeah, 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 yeah. same i was with my castle but then i've not seen some of the stuff like kiki's delivery service or totoro so yeah Hold, um, hold on. So, are, are they going to do like like sixty FPS, four K for all of them, or? I think I don't know what the plan is, like fidelity wise, like vision for the the whole like if it's going to run in ten eighty or whatever. But mm-hmm. definitely, definitely, they're getting the full library of Ghibli films on Netflix. So, um, because they lost, I think they lost the Disney stuff because Disney went to uh the Disney Plus side. I think in the UK, Sky TV are going to barter a deal with disney as well so they can run the disney plus stuff on them so i'll eventually get to see mandalorian but yeah netflix i think are trying to get more of the the ghibli stuff for a long time and then it kind of fell through and then didn't and then fell through and didn't and then just i think it was last week they announced that it's all coming like as of saturday they're going to be all on netflix so i was like oh shit so yeah i'm uh, I'm actually surprised yeah because i think all of the distribution like the physical distribution in the states was by disney right yeah, I think they had a deal for so long, um, probably actually till 2020. And I think when it came to renegotiate it, I think they've probably decided to go elsewhere or decided maybe Netflix has given them more money. I don't know what the, the case is, but um, yeah, that'll be really interesting because having those available will be quite handy because um, they're always good to watch and binge. I'm actually going with my partner on Friday to watch um, Spirited Away on like a cinema screen. Like a re- There's some cinemas in Glasgow are uh re-showing the films like on the big screen so nice. uh, i'm going to see spirited away uh on friday and at the end of february they're doing mononoke so wow i'm gonna, gonna watch that so yeah um, spirit away is my favorite it was the first one i watched years and years and years and years mm. ago um and then i think the second was hills moving castle and then i watched a couple of other ones on and off and then i think it took me up until last year or the year before to watch mononoke for the first time and then i was like 
why was I not watching this? Like, years ago? It's such <laughs> yeah. a good film. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So it's definitely been a a slog of getting all those films uh, watched. But yeah, there's there's so many though. And then obviously, he's starting to make new ones. And then there was one recently that came out. It was all like a kind of watercolor painting that moved and everything. And yeah, there's just there's so many of them. And then of course I'll be trying to get into some of the more bigger anime films that came out. Like, um, is it Your Name was one of them that came out mm. recently? Oh yeah. Yeah love that as well and then there's a recent one that just came out called is it three centimeters a second or five centimeters per second or something like that um it's all about like a, a rocket launch in japan but again there's there's so much to consume like it's just it's, it's almost impossible i mean i've got a, a crunchyroll membership at the moment from my anime oh, stuff wow. so gotcha i get that get that straight from tokyo but um like i'm i'm deep into my hero academia just now because nice nice i love that it's just such a good anime um and then i've started watching demon slayer but there's like there's just so much like it's hard i think i was watching black clover as well at one point which is really really good um but again i fell behind that because i'm just doing so much work and then trying to like catch up on them and watch the episodes i'm i'm getting to a point now i really need to stop actually when i'm just trying to watch the episode and skip through it and just like catch all the highlights rather than actually watch the whole 20 minutes oh you know um, what like that's that's actually what i do i, I just kind of yeah. look for youtube compilations for all these things um yeah i'm the same even with games now like if i can't be bothered sitting you know play a game like i'll just fire it on you know a screen next to me so i can just catch the gist of what it is um the only game i've recently invested in i think in the last oh god for a long long time was uh the new walking dead vr game came out recently for vive and oculus oh, um see sky skydance made it the guys who basically yeah. worked with telltale um so it's like a telltale walking dead game but in vr and um i've been playing it with my vive headset and it's incredible it's one of the best like because most vr games are like two or three gigabytes but this one was 35 Ooh. and i was like whoa but then so we you walk about ass content Oh yeah, like a ton. When you walk about nice. the cities, there you can walk in and out most houses and raid wow. all the drawers. And, yeah, and there's zombies around every corner, and you've got to like dig your knife into their skull to kill them and everything. And yeah, it's really, really interesting. You have to craft and you know build guns yourself and wander and not get killed and fight between factions. And it's like a full like mm. almost triple A game experience. It's the best thing I've played in VR since I think the Vader Immortal series, which was the the star wars vr thing that uh, ilm made which is just incredible it's like the closest thing to being a real life jedi it's so good gotcha. um especially with the oculus quest now because the quest allows you to play vr with no wires and no computer like it all just runs out the headset which is incredible like that's almost like making vr accessible to everybody because if you don't have to plug in a computer and you don't need any kind of cameras or anything um, have you heard mm-hmm. of the Oculus Quest? I I have the PS4 thing, the VR. Right. Yeah, not not the Oculus one. So the Oculus Quest is a VR headset with controllers, but everything runs out of the headset, so you don't need any computer or any console. Oh, shit. It's all in the headset. Nice. And uh, there's no wires, there's no cameras, nothing. You could literally just be in the middle of a street somewhere and put the Quest on your head and play a game, um, which is just incredible like Crazy. it makes it so accessible to people like i've seen uh yama yama Yurev, he was actually um going to events last year and he was taking the quest with him in his little mobile carry case and then he was just giving it to people in the middle of like rooms and then they were using um the sketching tool uh quill just to build stuff or medium to like make stuff and sculpt stuff just wherever yeah. they were they the computer they didn't need to plug anything in they just literally put the headset on their head and then they were just sculpted and drawn within five minutes so oh my god dude um, i i've been i've attended his workshops before i've been calling him jama this whole time like it w- i think yeah jama or yama people kind of get met but i think yama is the oh. official like his actual Crap. name um, <laughs> no it's cool i mean it's fine we know what it's like. we were just you know it's been, it took me 10 minutes initially today just to get your name right so like yeah it's, <laughs> but yeah. he is such a riot man i love him he, he was one of the most oh, like, uh because i I think there was a few um, art presenters that I truly, truly enjoy. And mm. Yama was one of them. And um, Ian McCaig, uh, the, the Star Wars. Oh, uh, Ian. Good dude. Yeah. He's actually, um, I think he's coming back at one point to teach in Scotland because uh, he qualified at the Glasgow School of Art in Scotland. That's where he got his uh, degree from oh. before he moved to the States inside working on Star Wars. So I see. 
he's always about to come back here and teach. So there was those rumors of him coming back to teach in Glasgow. But yeah, uh, Yama was funny, man, because uh, I was at Lightbox and I just bumped into him, and he was like, he was like, "Fucking hell, man! Like everywhere I go, you're like you're at every event." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, try to get around." <laughs> he's like, "Oh, it was so it's so good to hear like an accent from that side of the world." I've just been talking to Americans for the last week. <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah." But uh, oh, Yama's a cool dude, man. I, I first bumped into him at um, oh, IMAG in Paris in 2018. Mm. And um, yeah, he was just like just talking about his work in Star Wars at the time and everything he was doing. And he was talking about like how he worked for Lucasfilm. And I was like, oh, you mean ILM? And he was like, no. <laughs> Lucasfilm <laughs> is a completely different thing. Yes, it ILM, is. They, yeah. they just work in Star Wars, but they, yeah, it's, it's kind of that's it. But yeah, but it was funny because I, I said that at the time and he was like holding his face like, oh my God. Man, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a very Every different time. entity. Yeah, but it's so yeah, easily, yeah. easily bundled up together though. So of makes course, sense. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but then of course, in the last year, he's went freelance and he's just been working on stuff uh, by contract. But then I think the last time I saw him doing a talk, it was all about how he redesigned Aladdin, basically, and, and redesigned the genie and all the stuff for that film. So, yeah. Yeah, his, yeah, his, his, recent, um, his recent VR sculpt with the eagle catching the thing, that's oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. good. And he rendered yeah. it in Blender as well. Oh, mate. Like, the, the best examples I've seen of stuff in VR is uh, Goro Fajita. Mm, makes um, sense, Go- yeah. Goro's stuff in Quill is like oh, it's ridiculous. Like every day you see him doing like these thirty minute illustrations in 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 Quill, and oh man, I don't know how he manages to get the the just the complexity of a lot of the scenes he does in like half an hour. It's crazy. Like he just spends his lunch break making these little sculpts, and they're just they're just ridiculous. So yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. Like if you are comfortable with traditional medium, uh, which is kind of like why I, I still choose to sketch on pen and paper it right like when, when you jump back into digital it, it just becomes so much quicker yeah I've, i definitely found that even i was speaking to uh because we had glauco long in mm-hmm. uh, no longer on the podcast and glauco was saying his illustrations and studies in 2d have actually informed a lot of his 3d building um and stuff you know the way he sculpts um because yeah. he he talked about using gouache even recently and he was talking about how gouache in itself is like a medium where you almost sculpt the forms yes. as opposed to paint them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely, man. I even I even uh, remember watching an interview on um, uh, Blender Guru, and he was talking to a guy from Riot Games who'd done character development, but it was 2D and 3D he'd done. He'd done both of them. But he was just saying that, like, when you went to one medium, it informed the other one. So when people were like, oh, I don't want to sketch because that will take away from my sculpting, it actually adds to it. It actually contributes towards your sculpting. So... Yeah, definitely don't shy away from trying to vary mediums because they do feed into each other when you eventually make stuff. Um, even like you said, if you if you can sketch really well, if you have a good sketch hand, if you then walk into a Wacom Cintiq or just even an Intuos, like you'll find you sketch quicker or a bit more looser or a bit more f- flow in your mm-hmm. work because you've done that time on the the sketch pad. Yeah, that there's something in your in your brain that just becomes activated because i guess it's it's a one tool device right like a pencil or a pen yeah. so it, yeah. it it just gives you so little things to worry about and just you yeah. just do it and and it becomes just a direct translation of design i i yeah. i love what uh cloudo uh sorry uh Clogo? man i'm, I'm <laughs> killing his name as well so good uh whatever yeah but but he said like how digital art is is just there's too much options, and in fact, you want to reduce it. That was oh, Glauco. Uh, You're talking about Glauco. Yeah, yeah, Glauco. There we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no he's, he was saying the same. It's like there's there's so much, but then when you look at like how VR sculpting is coming along, I reckon mm. w- w- when those tools start to accelerate, it's going to eventually, because they're, they're so much closer to traditional sculpting yeah. than using a pen on a tablet like because that's that's almost like the opposite that's like drawn but then yeah if you could physically mold with those tools and like an oculus setting then yeah you could start to see those be mixed more into production um because i know yama was talking about they were using it early on even chris um a couple of guys from some of the studios in london and pinewood were saying that they were building sets in 3d and then putting the headset on the director and he was able to walk around the sets in 3d and get a feeling for how the space would lay before they built it. So I think VR is going to be 
more and more integrated as time goes on. I think it's definitely going to be something that's going to become like a major production tool in games and movies. Yeah, and I think like um, muscle memory comes more into play as well, like just being able to move your entire arm and, and actually have it yeah. come out on screen. Um, I think they, they did the same thing for the the Lion King film. I think all of the cinematography was done in VR. So they, they literally built the whole savannah in 3D. Most likely, I would imagine, yeah. It definitely is, I think, for just the more you can speed that production up in most of these these sets... I think yeah, it's it's more and more asked for because time is money in mm-hmm. any aspect of the production. So if you can make that a lot quicker or visualized a lot quicker, then yeah, people would definitely get behind that as soon as they can. Because the it, you know, the production company three hundred, four hundred pounds for a headset is like jump change. And if you yeah. buy a couple of them for that department, like you know, because even then, if you if you think now with the Quest, you can run the whole thing in the yeah. headset. You don't even, yeah. you don't even need a computer. So if you're if you're version up like a three or four thousand built machine and then versus a couple hundred pound for a headset you know what i mean the headset's going to win every time mm-hmm. so um so yeah yeah definitely the, the future is in an interesting kind of um time period where these new technologies are becoming more con- like even guys i know who now do uh concept and but they do it like exclusively in procreate like they don't even use photoshop anymore yep so so like you know, now that these tools are getting more advanced, then yeah, like eventually it's going to get to a point where you can just pick and choose, you know, what you want to use. It's the same for 3D artists, right? You've got Modo, you've got Maya, you've got Max, you've got Blender. You know, especially Blender recently has become a major contender. So, yeah, Absol- there's just. Yeah, I absolutely just, love Blender. I mean, I've, I've been using it more and more in my work. Yeah. Well, people were saying it was at 2.7 or 2.8, like as soon as that hit, like the whole thing changed there was so many ah, like seven. massive features yeah yeah it, yeah, it yeah with seven where they, they kind of cleaned up their act a little bit because the, the, right. the ui ux was kind of like their biggest weakness right and with with 2.8 and now 2.82 it's like mm-hmm. uh it's it's stable enough it's quite a beast right yeah more more similar to stuff like maya or max like the traditional stuff mm-hmm. um yeah yeah because I've, I've used maya forever yeah, same um, same i i started with 8.5 wow that's going back up hell yeah th- I, I don't even know i'm on like it's just a year now right so you just get like maya 2019 yeah yeah this was before they used kind of the year coding same Years, as the, yeah, yeah. i think i was on photoshop 7 during my student time maya for me was 2017 model model or 2016 sorry was the first one um, I think I used, but then even that was like brand new when we were using it. So yeah, like I've definitely been using it for a while, but then I feel very comfortable with just the, the UI. I don't know. I'd want to try and move across to stuff like Blender or Modo, but then I suppose once I solidify my skills in Maya, I can then try to transition across to other things. But I'm so comfortable right now because I'm on custom shelves and everything. So, and I know my hotkeys, so oh, it's quicker for me. Yeah. yeah qu- quicker for me to make stuff in that than it is to sit in Blender for half an hour wondering where all the buttons are. Um, but I think eventually I'll probably try and start moving across. But I know like Maya and ZBrush and Substance are like my three main pipelines that I want to try and get really down before I go into a studio because, um, you know, ZBrush, you've got your sculpting, Maya, you've got your hard surface stuff. And then, of course, uh, Substance for, for texture and everything. So, um, yeah, because, uh, yeah, so I, once I've got those down, I'll start to venture out, but... At the moment, I'm quite happy just in there. And of course, Photoshop eventually when I need it, I can use that as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a it's a strange time, right? Because I think 3D, the, the need to specialize for 3D art has become more and more apparent in my opinion. Like, yeah. I, I have friends who just only do substance designer and painter yeah. and they get... And they have to be so good at it, right? Because they're they're kind of doing basically all of the materials in the game. Yes. Um, and I've done it. I've done materials recently in, in Designer, and it's a great program to make them. But yeah, like you will probably find you'll need to specialize in the massive studios. Like if you're going to AAA development, they'll have their own texture department and their own mm-hmm. like organic department. So if you're going to specialize, yeah, definitely like Substance is a great one to do because. They're always looking for textured artists because it's such a, a niche. Like there's Javier Perez, uh, like he's done amazing stuff with designer in the last couple of years, even building geometry, you know, just out of pure designer files with height maps. 
and um and yeah he's been working on the last of us and stuff like that he's just kind of a gun for hire for sony but mm. yeah definitely i think at the start of the junior side of it it'll be just a guy getting a general grip of anything you know maya related and zbrush and, and substance and building like an overall package and then going into studios and be like well i can i can model something i can uv it um texture it you know and then put it in a an engine so yeah also working in engine so stuff like unreal uh, or uni also getting a hang of that. So, mm, yeah, but it depends, it depends what I want to go through. There's there's multiple avenues for doing 3D, but yeah, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I've been dabbling with with Unreal Engine quite a bit this this past two years as well. As Amanda, have have you given the sequencer a shot? No, I mean I've I've tried it occasionally for doing some rendering stuff, but um, I think the good thing about working in real time is that you can render that stuff super fast. Whereas oh, yeah pre-render stuff takes forever but then like when you're working in 60 fps you're thinking 60 frames per second <laughs> that, that's hella fast to render a scene it is so uh, yeah it makes sense why people are now putting a lot of this stuff in unreal because um it's just a it's just a click of a button and bam you have a sequence even up into 4k like yeah you make 4k there's in a couple of seconds so it's and, it's crazy yeah. and it's actually i mean the, the amount of work that they're doing to make it more user-friendly you know because i think prior to this like you needed like some sort of programming degree to even operate the thing oh yeah well yeah. remember when unreal was like it cost you money to have this the software now people can just download it for free exactly. so i mean yeah it's crazy how and the fact that even like epic had so much money from fortnite yeah. they were just giving away free games every week they were just throwing games at people like here we've paid the publisher like millions of dollars just have all these games for free exactly yeah um, so like yeah, it's becoming an absolute powerhouse now. But yeah, like Unreal used to cost a fortune to if even if you were into developing you want to just use it to build like a small game, you still had to pay something like a thousand dollars just to have the license. Mm -hmm. But now it's free. So you just download it and use it at your heart's content. There's people can make games in a weekend. Especially I've seen a lot because it was because there was so much um open market for the VR space because nobody was making any games for it. So people were like making like really crappy like VR games with a lot of the Sinti Studios stuff. Do you ever hear of Sinti Studios? They make um like packs of like um like people and assets for games, but they're really super low poly. I Have see. Okay. Of... So so yeah. that's just for like quick game developments then, yeah. Yeah, basically you can just throw like you can buy like a city pack that comes with buildings and cars and people oh, and you gotcha. can just throw them in. Um but yeah Sinti Studios make some incredible stuff. They made a cyberpunk thing recently. Oh, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. But um but yeah, like people can make games in a weekend now, so it's just oh, it's, it's getting to a point now. It's like it's hard to catch up. It's, everything moves so fast. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll get there. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be fine. We'll manage. Um, so anyway, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap that up a little bit now because uh, we're obviously I'm wanting to make sure you get back to doing whatever you were doing, and I'm not going to keep you for too long. But uh, but yeah, it's been really awesome. We've talked about a lot of things and your career was one of them and your whole approach to to modeling and, and using your concept stuff so yeah i think we'll, we'll definitely try and get you back on at one point and talk further in depth about um projects you've worked on and, and any any advice for for students but yeah if you guys got any uh questions uh just leave them down in the comments and we'll get back to you uh as soon as we can um or if you know anybody else you'd like to hear from or have me interview um again just leave it in the comments and we'll try and integrate it as best we can um just to say thanks very much Farrell, for coming on and giving up his time um very thankful for um for giving up in your day and talking to me man i really appreciate it thank you for coming on it's been a pleasure oh, it's a pleasure man thank you so much for the invite really honored yeah of course man that's awesome um and again yeah if you're on youtube or anything or you're on uh spotify or anywhere you're listening to this just make sure you give it a little share or a like or a review it helps us out in the channel and uh yeah we'll just catch you guys in the next episode um again we'll be coming back once uh every month so hopefully again in the next four weeks three weeks you'll hear from me again but until that time uh thanks to you guys for listening and we'll catch you later bye guys <laughs>